Hello, Cynthia Allen here for the Move Better, Feel Better Feldenkrais Awareness Summit. Here we are back again, and this is a super special interview that we have for you today. And I'm, I'm just extremely excited to uh, take you there. So I wanna introduce you to Mia Siegel. Mia Siegel was Dr. Feldenkrais's first assistant and collaborator I think if we could say that there was anyone that was sort of like the mother of the Feldenkrais method, it might be Mia. I mean, she might disagree with that. We'll see what she says. But Dr. Feldenkrais did a lot with Mia in those first 16 years where they really collaborated and worked together. And we're going to be talking today about, you know, what has been the influences over Mia's life and, and her profession and her understanding of this work. And where does she want to see it go? What does she want to tell us? now that she's got, I think, 70 years of experience, maybe close, yeah. So 70 years of experience is worth, worth a lot for us to all uh, learn something from. Welcome, Mia. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And I think it'll be a pleasure to talk about it too. Good, good. I'm, I'm looking forward to a good conversation together. So I, I do think that maybe we could start a little bit on some of your influences because you, you did study, of course, with Moshe Feldenkrais for quite a long time, but you studied some other things along the way. So we just have a little more grasp of what has been, what's been in the soup of making Mia Siegel and your understanding of the Feldenkrais work. Well, I did start actually with the doing the, the learning the Alexander method in England. But to say what had the most uh, impact on me is the directions that Moshe put me to, to become curious about. So actually, even though I came already knowing how to to look at uh, the human function and body and behavior in a certain way. Uh, it, my greatest uh, and biggest, of course, and for the longest time, was under Moshe's direction. Like, uh, I don't think that ever before him I was uh, I was thinking of uh, going and jo joining and doing judo or something. So the way he used to tell us his stories, he was uh, really very infectious to the whole family actually. And it, it never started with me as wanting to do this work actually. It was just the fascination that I, when I saw him give a lesson and I thought, wow, so is that what it can be? And after that, I said, look, I'm going to stick around and just watch. And only later did I realize how I got more and more involved. And I could never say what was the first lesson I ever gave because he just put me into it. He said, you want to watch? Watch. And it became part of my life, going and watching what he's doing, asking questions for which he was a marvelous, marvelous teacher. And then it also turned into a friendship to the family. So he, he would come to our house and as you can see, Leora is doing it, my daughter, and my, my son also does things similar. And my parents did it, and my friends did it. It just got integrated into our lives. Mm. So it was, and it was never a planned study, like take a book and I write down what did you say. Nothing, we, li we lived it. And uh, we lived not far, uh, we lived in Tel Aviv, all of us. And uh, Moshe used to come for the weekends and it'll mix. My friends also, they got used to the idea that there's this guy 
staying here and suddenly he gets up and lies on the floor and shows something to everybody. So it was never a formal teaching. It, I think the only time it became formal was when we came to America in 75. Mm -hmm. It seems like it was really like the, the real old fashioned apprenticeship. Uh, and yet I would say maybe not quite with you because it seems like the collaborative nature of, as because as, he was still developing the work really. So the collaborative nature of how the two of you, your, your observations it had to have an influence on him as well. Uh, yes, I think that it was, he wrote it to me actually in one of the books that he gave me, he wrote and he said that the fact that I was there to, to watch what he's doing was a catalyst in his uh, giving the lessons. And the fact, look, he worked by himself. And here he had like a feedback with every lesson. We'd look again and, and afterwards talk about it. It was the, it made a difference. Mm -hmm. So for him, it was a little bit like an inspiration, although it was his, uh, his ideas and his inventions and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we think about the Feldenkrais method, we, we had these two terms that we use, functional integration and awareness through movement and under this umbrella of the Feldenkrais method. And that's just one of like hundreds of ways people could explore movement and their body and their psyche. How can we differentiate the Feldenkrais method approach maybe from some of the others? What, what is it that we have that is that we can even say is unique or special or is our magic ingredient or just occurred to me when you said it, that uh, you say, how can it, we differentiate it from the rest? Is no, we have it and all the rest differentiated themselves from it. I, I really, I've, I've looked at what's been happening to this work in the years that followed. So, Unfortunately, Moshe didn't live long enough, but uh, I feel that uh, when we arrived in America in 75, and he taught that first training in San Francisco, we did. At that time, really, I feel that we gave all the, the all the, the basic and the spirit and the tools and the ideas and the basic of his philosophy and how to do it. I say tools, yes. And um, the more I look at it, the more I can see that in those three years, it was three summers in San Francisco. In those three summers, we, yeah, the, the, you've got everything there. Everything up to then. The only thing is that he didn't keep, he didn't stop there from thinking and from exploring and from searching uh, for people uh, like uh, people who spiritually and intellectually he can, he can associate with, and he, he introduced us to people like uh, Van Forrester and to Carl Prebram and to uh, Milton Erickson and to many people who at that time were also kind of opened the doors to the idea that mind body is one, one unit and that uh, hey, you've got a picture there. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> wow. It, it, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And he kept actually living and exploring and uh, 
developing and evolving. But in the first, if you go through the, the stuff we, which we brought in 75, there is really everything. And I think that when I see people teach today and I watch what happened to it, it really spread unbelievably uh, so much. You would have had the kick out of it. But uh, uh, there is everything. If, you, if you've got that, you've got this work. The only thing is that he kept on thinking about it and he kept on bringing into it if he met more interesting people who thought like him and were on the same wavelength that he is. Mm -hmm. So he brought the thoughts into him and together they evolved. Mm -hmm. I mean, with his meetings with von Forrester or for, with Carl Pribram or with Milton even, it, it, it was nourishing for both sides. Yeah. And that we didn't record, unfortunately. But uh, I, I think that if somebody really uh, is acquainted and understands not to, not to find it as a trick, but to go into what was given in uh, San Francisco at that time, one can evolve it and develop it. And on this, realize the thinking and the method and how had Moshe been alive, how he would have gone on. So when you say to not recognize it as a trick, does that mean like um, to not get caught up in like a little magic moment where yes. somebody is able to turn their head more? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's good to turn your head more. Sure. But what about a little more then? Just a little bit after that, and a little bit after that. And then also to have the presence of mind and the wish and the timing, timing is so important, timing of saying, wait, I turned my head a little bit there. What did it do to me? And then think, how did I feel about it? How did I think about it? Why didn't I turn it more before? Who stopped me? Why stopped me? All this is now for us to go on with, to, to get into the, our roots more, explore us more, monitor us better. So you, we don't want to stop at that little moment where people can turn their head more. We want to keep asking more questions, it sounds like. Absolutely, more. The whole thing is about know yourself, explore yourself, find yourself. And uh, yeah, I think it'll, if this went on like this, it'll be a better world, by the way. But uh, it's, it's, it can get much more exciting because obviously it's exciting that you turn your head that much and suddenly, oh, I'm turning it all the way around. But what happened to you in between all this? Who are you? Where are you? Why didn't you do it before? How come you didn't before? Did you think of it before? Things like that. And you can't do it all the time, but this is how it could grow forever. It's, uh, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, so you asked a couple of really, I think, different questions that we don't often hear in lessons, which is, who are you? Where are you? Why did you choose what you chose? Uh, but particularly this, who are you? So it gives me a hint that you're, you're seeing how the work can allow a person to be, I, I don't know what, more, more clear about who they are? What does it allow for the person besides turning their neck? What happens can happen for them if, if we go further? It's wonderful because you, you can, first of all, life is great because always you can find, I do something that I didn't do before. Or you can find, we all, are, we all have 
imagination and our brain is working all the time. And suddenly you say, oh, when I turned like this the first time, that's how I fell in love with my husband. I don't know what happened, I'm just saying a, a, an example of what is it connected to? And why didn't I turn it again? And why did I turn it again? And it suddenly it associates with something you did and you get more complete yourself. It completes who you are, I think. And the whole idea was to complete who you are because then you explore and you find that you've got qualities that will surprise you. There's no limit. There's no limit. But if you stop asking questions, there's a limit. Mm -hmm. To complete who you are. I love yeah. that. I love that. So when we are creating an environment for our students to learn in, what are some of the underpinnings or you know key things that you think we as teachers uh, need to have in the environment for the student to be able to, to know more about who they are? What are some of the key components? First of all, curiosity. Be interested, it's fascinating. Because here, yeah, look, I'm talking to you. I don't know much about you, but I'm very interested to know more and more and more. And the same is if somebody comes to you with a, with a shoulder. Already, the shoulders is interesting, but okay, we, all, we know all about it. We learned FI and ATM. But who is she? What does she feel? How did it happen to her? What, you know, and also you learn empathy. There are so many things that you learn through this. One of the things that I'm, I would, I wish if I was born today, I'd start teaching with children, for instance. So many things. First of all, I think I've never seen anybody teach responsibility unless it's integrated to other things. But look, you can take a child and say, pick up your arm. They pick up the arm and then you say, why did you stop there? And suddenly any child can do it. And they'll say, because you told me, no, I didn't tell you. So why did you? And you show them that there is, I have authority, it's my choice, I can do, I'm in charge, and I can change my mind and I have other choices. I could actually go here, I could actually, and I wouldn't just throw it in a child, but integrate it into our FIs, our, in, our ATMs, our way of thinking. And it can be a child of 88 years old also, and I've seen it. You can take people really that they, they, they knew nothing about monitoring themselves and paying attention to who they are. And suddenly you show them that, look, you are interesting. And an old woman or man who, who really had no idea, they're never bored now. All they do is sit in the chair and they think, yeah, so if I can do this or that. And they, it, uh, it changes even old people's life. So I think that that is how I see this work going on. Because I'm not the only one. I mean, I had the luck of the good fortune of being close to Moshe and having long discussions like this and connecting it with the Far East and Buddhism and yoga and all sorts of things. But anybody can do it. And today there's, look, when I started working with him, people used to say to me, how can you work with such a quick? <laughs> and I had to explain to them that, uh, that he's not a quick really, he's a doctor. Actually, he finished science in the Sorbonne in France. But uh, today the door is open. Already you can do so many things. And that's why I think 
I don't know if there's such a thing as reincarnation or something. If he came back, it would be great fun. Well, the door is wide open. You're absolutely right, Mia. We see that at, with this summit that the door is wide open. People do want to move better and feel better. And I think that when we say feel better, they, they do want to know who they are. And, uh, and they want to be curious about their lives. And they want to know that other people are curious about their lives. And what a difference. Yeah. Yeah. What a difference in relationship if we assume that we're interested in each other than and not uh, what we can do you know there's a, such a difference and in, i'm interested in you only if i know what you can do as opposed to being interested in you as a as a being yeah yeah so there's some things that um we do and well actually i want to say something about fi and atm for people who are listening so fi is the abbreviation for functional integration and ATM is the abbreviation for awareness through movement. So functional integration is usually our one-to-one -one work where the practitioner puts hands on the person. And then awareness through movement ATM is usually the group leg classes. So just to give people, anybody that didn't know that, a little clue about that. So I want to just say in here something is that for me, it's a big revelation how much you can do in uh, verbal instructions. Now that we have no choice and we use Zoom, we opened another dimension also. It's really true. I, I had resisted uh, teaching Ruthie Alon's work online a lot. I mean, I was doing a little bit with it, but now that there's no choice, I've been doing huge amounts and well, as well as my own uh, regular Feldenkrais classes. And the amount of uh, change people are getting is so remarkable, isn't it, Mia? I mean, it's 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 beautiful. It's beautiful, and I think that they it's are beautiful for you because we didn't know we can do it. Yeah, I mean, I knew I could do some of it, but I didn't realize it could ever be as powerful as it is. Yeah. I I feel like this is you know like all all challenges in life. You get um, the things you didn't want to get out of the challenge, and then you get this this door that opens that you wouldn't have opened without the challenge. And so for us, the, the pandemic has opened a door uh, for many, many people to get to the Feldenkrais method and to get improvement that I don't think they would have otherwise gotten. So I think it's an incredible time, yeah. incredible time. And, I, and then I think, I'm sure that that makes you think, well, wouldn't Moshe be excited to see that potential yeah. ar arising, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably he'll take me to places I didn't know about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We often talk about in our work, uh, we make a contrast about our work and maybe some other kinds of approaches that it's not exercise. It's not a series of mindless repetitions, we might say. I think maybe the fundamental thing is this is a learning process vis-a-vis uh, healing, healing and curing and uh, because I find out, for instance, if somebody comes with a problem in the knee, there are, there are professional people who I never will know about the knee as much as they do. And all the conditions of uh, diseases and things we don't know we didn't learn this and it's not in our in our um, schedule or something i think but we are teaching we are teaching how to discover how to monitor ourselves to know ourselves and how to realize that the empathy that you will feel towards us very easy to share it, to feel that with somebody else because bo bottom line, we're all the same. So it's this is the difference. This is where I'm not healing and I'm not curing or anything. But people come to me because they think maybe she'll cure my shoulder. But, it's, but I think, OK, I'll, I'll help your shoulder if I can. But through a different channel. 
And then maybe I'll do them even a better favor because they can connect it emotionally or um, psychologically or his historically with something that happened that I wouldn't even know. Okay, so that makes me want to ask, what is the role of a person's story in their recovery in the Feldenkrais method? In our approach, what is the role of their story? That's, that's, that's the all there is, the person's role. There's nothing to the story except the, this person's role. I, I think really the, the, my role is how to elicit it and to bring it to, to be practical for them. But the role is completely yours. Completely yours. And look, why does somebody come to me and then they don't come? Because they're not interested anymore or because they're looking for something else and quicker. I don't know why they do or not. So I think a lot is the person himself. What is he craving for? Look, when I came to work with Moshe, he already had groups of people who came to him for ATMs. Nobody came to him like me and said, I want to sit with you and see what you do. And I thought, why aren't they coming? There were many women and teachers of gym and everything. And I was the only one who came to him, held on to him and said, Moshe, I don't want to work for you. I don't want anything. I just want to sit and watch. Why? Because they didn't have that role of, of to go and, and, and uh, yeah, I, don't, I can't say I wanted to be like him. I simply wanted it, that's it. So, you know that for, I'm sure with all the people you're working with, how a big thing depends on somebody who suddenly gets up one day and says, okay, I've learned enough. And you know in your heart, you say, oi, 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 I could give you a little more. So that's, mm -hmm. I think that's the role. Right. So somebody shows up to see you or me and uh, they start telling about their shoulder pain and then they tell about the original accident and then they maybe tell something about from their childhood. So they have um, a narrative, a story that they tell. And how, how is it that we view that story in our work? Do we, what do we do with that story? Do we elicit more of it? What do, where do we go with that story? We as, as the, the teachers, mm -hmm. I think just it's, it's terribly important to dig in a hole into the place which is self-monitoring. To dig into the place which is what? Self-monitoring. Self-monitoring. Yes. Self-monitoring. show them that actually inside them, there's such a wealth of exciting stories. Now, okay, your shoulder is, I can talk about your shoulder and we can talk about somebody else's shoulder. We can talk about this skeleton who is in this room shoulder. And just to go deeper, that's what I say. That's why I say it's work forever because I could have come really because I don't know, I'm a basketball player and I want to, throw further and uh, how can you, I would like to make you more excited about the way you play basketball or something. I think that's where we can, we can, do, we can make them more excited about their resources. Even, even if, if somebody has a painful shoulder, Let's make it even more interesting. The, it's, it's so interesting why it's painful. And then now I've got another thing. And that is, well, um, it's not politics, but I, we, I think I told it to 
somatics, that uh, for many years, Moshe said, listen, we've got to find a name for this work. Did I tell you this story? No, I'm ready to hear it. Oh. And because he said, Feldenkrais is such a terrible word, nobody will ever say it. So we kept making words and words and words, and my father was a well-known linguist, and we all said the making names. Many years passed, and then we came to America, and the name remained Feldenkrais. And everybody says it today, right? <laughs> but uh, one day, I said, Moshe, I found a name. Somebody found a name. And this is President Obama. When he said he swept the whole nation by saying, yes, I can. Our work is yes, I can. Because if this shoulder is so painful, let's see, why is this yes, I can, and this no, I can't. So let's study the yes, I can. If he can turn his head that much, let's study why he can turn his head that much and hear only to hear. So let's start, we are studying the yes, I can. If you go to give a eye to somebody, First, you go to the place that is good. Oh, it's moving. Nice. And you say, look, this is a nice feeling. You don't go to, yes, I can't. You go to, yes, I can. And that's how you build an FI. You go from the, yes, I can, to a, yes, I can, to a, yes, I can. And you enlarge it. So this is our work. And that's it. I don't know if uh, Obama has a copyright on this. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what a shift. And yeah. What a shift. So you're, you're, you're saying, say, let's go away from the problem. You're saying, let's not focus on the problem. And let's empower people. Both. People are such specialists on the problem. It's amazing. They know better than all the doctors and neurologists on the problem. But what is the no problem? And oh, no, no problem. And I thought that would be a great name for our work. Mm, I like it. That's very creative. I like it a lot. So we, we um, uh, let's, let's talk about those specialists for a moment, those specialists who know way more about the knee. What is the role of anatomy in our work? Oh, I, I think it's an eye opener. I mean, you are dealing with something that is alive and changing. And it has changed in a way that undesirable so much. So if, yeah, the more you know about something that you handle, the better it is. I, I th yeah, I think it's necessary. Wonderful, thank you for that. And how about how we use language? What what is how can we help someone kind of notice some things? Because they can right now during the summit, they're doing awareness through movement lessons from teachers all around the world. They can tune in to get those anytime. What are some things that we could maybe help them kind of notice about the language um, of of teaching lessons? What is it? What are our? Well, how is it we talk? Well, I think first of all to realize how important it is to be true to the to the to what you want to express so that uh, that you don't uh, not, not to be negative or running down something or I've seen people trying to show that they know so much about this knee that they tell how terrible it can be and it can be connected to the digestion and the little ear and the nose, and it's a terrible thing. I think that we, we, really, we really should refrain from, we should stop ourselves from saying unpleasant things. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. you can leave this to the doctor. He'll, he'll already say it. 
<laughs> so you can see, you can, you can find out all the I can things mm -hmm. and, and give hope. And also you, people will experience what it means if you, if you say the positive things and you prove it, you can't just say, you have to prove. And you say, look, a shoulder can do not only this, it can also do that. So if you can prove it, the person trusts you. Once they trust you, you can transfer it to other places. And you connect it to good memories, good feelings, with good words. With the, yes, the, if you look at everybody, then there's so many nice things to say about them. Also not nice things to say about them, but look at the nice. Look at the nice. And give it, and it, it really, I, it, I think it helps. I'm, I'm sure it helps, I'm sure it helps. So when we teach an awareness through movement lesson, we start guiding people through a series of movements. Yeah. And Feldenkrais used to say, it's not the movements. What did he mean when he says it's not the movements? Because you can do, you can do the same movement and go cause damage. And you can do the same, not more, uh, it's, a, it's a, not just a movement, it's a process. process. And, and, and you can do the same combination of uh, moving and suddenly it's open up. So th this is the work actually, the process. Mm -hmm. So we have repetitive movements. We do, we do say do a movement, you know, we might not say many times, but we guide people through a process where they can do it many times. And yet we don't want people to do it, uh, do it repetitively. <laughs> That's kind of funny. We yeah. do it many times, but we don't want people to do it repetitively. What, what is it that we're, we're, how are we trying to guide the person? What is it that we're doing with our words that makes that not a repetitive experience? I think it's very easy and it's wonderful. You, you ask to do something and notice how do you reverse it, that's all. And that reversing is a wonderful teacher because you can always reverse something, I mean, I can pick my arm that much. Maybe I can't pick it further, but I can come back. This, I've been there already. So I can reverse. So I reverse and I say, how did I do that? Hmm, can I do this a little further or something? But uh, re repetition can be ex very exciting. If you think, how did you get there? And can you really, really reverse it? And you'll see what will happen to your, to your uh, students. It, it's great. It's a great thing to do. So in this reversibility, can you reverse it? Can, can you be curious about it? It's a word you used earlier. Can you be curious about it? So there's some sensory rich language that we're using that we try to, I guess what you're saying, open up the, uh, I can, uh, yes, we can, yes, I can. We're trying to open up more of that experience of yes, I can. Widen it, yeah. Widening it uh, and, and then associating the sensations that they have with this, this extremely positive feeling, this movement with this extremely positive feeling. And I guess in the way that we touch people in the, the Feldenkrais work, there must be something similar what is the qualities of touch that we want to foster? The, the touch in SI? Mm -hmm. In FI? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you want to, to guide. It's, it's the same thing. The whole thing is the same thing. Like, depends, depends how experienced you are and how refined you are. And and uh, every, to every movement that you move somewhere, you come, that's what I'm 
I'm doing now, and it works so nicely because you go to a place and there you say, ah, oh, I can't go any further. And that point is where you have all the possibilities. I can't hear, so I can there. It's a choice point. Where you stuck is the choice point. And if you say, but I can't go anywhere, I'm stuck here. But you forget, you can reverse. Ah, I've been there before. So you study the core, the, the, the happening of the thing. So when you say also that it depends on how refined you are yourself, how many uh, functional integration lessons did you get for yourself from Moshe or anybody? Oh my God. I don't know, I, th I think of, uh, for Moshe millions and for the many people I gave many lessons, but um, I think I live it. No, I want to know I how many how many of you received. Have has, have I have, have needed that. Yeah, have, have you received functional integration lessons? You would say you're very refined, or, or or you're talking about refinement. I'm wondering how you got that refinement. A lot. <laughs> I don't know. I think it never ends. Look, look at yourself. For instance, even now, I'm sure. You can, for a moment, just think of yourself and how you're sitting. Mm -hmm. and notice, are you comfortable a little more? Can you do something about it? Mm -hmm. There you are. There's your lesson. What you just did. Yeah. It becomes part of life, I think. So you, you found this clarity for yourself by living this sort of questioning process for yourself. Probably. Probably, maybe. Yeah. And also, I, I like to look at people and see things. Uh -huh. It's it's interesting to you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. I, I I think that's different than saying it's interesting. It's wonderful. Yeah. There's a kind of delight uh, when you say it's wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. That. I think for some of us, it's interesting. I don't know if it's delight. So there's a different quality in the tone of your voice there. It's wonderful. <laughs> Maybe. I think it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. If I didn't like it, I couldn't do it for so long. Yeah. 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 There's in one of the articles, I'm not sure which one, because I kind of read a lot of articles, interviews that you've done over the years. Somebody said that you, and this was a long time ago, so you may not remember ever saying it, but maybe you will, that you said that the place which hurts is the most innocent. The place which hurts is the most innocent. Sometimes. Very Sometimes. interesting. Yeah, but it, yeah, that's true, actually, because if, I, if you look at the body, you can look at it as many things. You can look at it even as a, 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 an orchestra or a group of people or a community. All the little parts are building, are making a body. And then your, your shoulder hurts. And then you think this poor shoulder the hip doesn't know there's a shoulder, so it doesn't move when you want to lift the shoulder. Try it with the hip. The, the knee doesn't help it, the foot doesn't help. The neck doesn't help it. That, so that's why the, the shoulder is the most innocent. So it's like it's been unsupported. Yeah, yeah. well, it's a victim. It's a victim. If you say it's a victim altogether, it's a good word. <laughs> I think that's a really important point because a lot of times we kind of develop an enemy relationship with that which hurts in us. So we see it, we, we hear people describe yeah. like myself, say it about myself. It's my bad shoulder, it's my bad knee, or it's, you know, in a, in a way it's a kind of blaming. Yeah, it's true. So when you look at it as it's been the unsupported one or the, uh, the victim in the system, that's a whole different 
Yeah, because when you want to lift your this arm, here I shift my weight, I lift my arm, my, my shoulder blade moves, my chest opens up. And when I want to pick this up, I don't, I don't do all these things. And then I try uh, 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 with the shoulder. And all this, what's the matter with you? Why don't you help? Like this helps you, you don't help this. <laughs> Something like that. Well, where do you hope the Feldenkrais method or Moshe's teachings go over the next years? Where, what's like, what's, what's we, what have we not looked at? Where could we go yet? What are you thinking? Are you still dreaming about those kinds of things? Yeah, I, I do it. That's why I, I like teaching all these little groups that I do now, because I feel that it, if, the, if I can transmit it to, to, let's say, I do it like six people, eight people maximum at a time, and if I can transmit this to them, and they know, because they know all the all the lessons, the ATMs, and they know if I, and they know, and they know a lot, they, they work all the time. So now come to what you know, and look at it from that point of view of how to continue it. And uh, I, that I say, I think I said it to, to the, in, in the interview that I put for somatic, somatics, that um, when, when we first started uh, working, we wrote one book and I helped Moshe in it and we wrote it, it was beautiful. And we had a little uh, wooden doll at the time, that's the nearest to a skeleton we could get. And we had it actually, this is the table we did it on. I brought it to America. Oh, wow. <laughs> we photographed it on this. And we did the raise the arms. It, it was very nice. So when, uh, when we, uh, we, we finished the book, we gave it the name in Hebrew, calling if I translate it prop, uh, exactly the words, um, refinement of ability. For, like for instance, if you can move the arm or turn the head that much, if you refine it, you can turn it even more, yeah? So that's where the refinement comes from. So they translated it into English and they published it in America and they called it Awareness Room Movement. But uh, I think that the future of this thing is refining your ability. If you're a basketball player, you can refine the way you throw. It's, uh, it like puts it on the borderline of art. You refine art, you can, you can make a beautiful drawing of a flower, but uh, not like Van Gogh. So the refinement is what we're after now because we all know ATM and FI. Take the same ATM and FI, and there's also many kilometers to run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is an interesting shift in refinement of movement, awareness through movement. We've become, um, I think we've become quite enamored with the word awareness. And I don't think there's a reason not to be enamored with the no, word because awareness. because at that time, the really people weren't aware. Yeah. Yeah, but, but the ongoing process, the refinement uh, makes the clarity of the ongoing process. Yeah. Because it's endless. It is endless. In a way. It is, in a way. I mean, you, you can all spend, decide how you want to spend your days and times and what you, want to, what you want to be working on to improve. But yeah, it is endless in a way. Do you see anything that is habitual in the Feldenkrais community that is kind of a challenge or, or a problem in our ability of taking Moshe's legacy forward? Is there anything that like strikes you as something we really 
you know, we need to, to be a little more aware of and, and take, take on? I don't know, you know, I'm not very much in touch with the Feldenkrais. A few organizations that came out. There, there was, it has a history that I wouldn't like to repeat. And um, I really don't know. There are many people and they do it in different ways. So I, I couldn't give you a good opinion. Yeah, I wasn't uh, thinking much about the actual uh, different organizations, but just, just anything that you think that we've gotten into kind of as practitioners, it may be a, a habit that you see over and over again. You see so many of us over the years, you probably watched a lot of our evolution um, individually, but also you probably see differences in students through the decades. I think it, but honestly, I really think it not, it's not important to do many movements and exercises because you can actually learn a lot, a lot, even from one movement. That is definitely true. I, I believe. So, so maybe sometimes we might put too much emphasis on doing lots of different lessons. when I, we, I think it's not necessary. Right. I, I could see that from the short series that I did with you that you're really interested in us dialing in, really coming into that, that moment of reversibility and, and why we didn't go further and, and then just going for the next lesson and the next lesson and the next lesson, perhaps we skip over that. But also I, I took into account with, with the groups that I teach now, that they've done all the ATMs. I mean, most of the ATMs. Right. These are people who already teach. So, right. Yeah. So but you're really talking about experienced practitioners here. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. experience. And and Leora is right. She that that I very often say, you can in one movement teach a lot, a lot, and not not necessary to keep giving new, 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 new combinations. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I'm really in love with all those combinations. That's going to be hard for me. <laughs> no, you don't give it up. You don't give it up. But when you teach, so people think you, you get yoga. They always repeat the same combination, nearly. And it lasted for how many thousands of years? I don't know. So it's true that you can do it with one movement for many, many, many hundreds of years. But um, it depends on, on the personality of the teacher and the student. It's good to know them though. Yeah, it's it fun. is good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is good to know. It is good to know the people you're working with. It helps you to do what you said in the beginning, which is to be really interested in who they are, which- yeah. I mean, as I think it's a reflection back on ourselves that we're uh, as well, that it, that it forms a, a, an interesting back and forth about exploring each other in life and what all this means together, because it doesn't mean for you clearly, and it doesn't mean for me that this is about uh, just the physical piece. It's sort of like, for me, the physical piece is sort of like the, um, mm, that's sort of like the, the most basic Part of it that you know that it, that people can be freer from pain is a wonderful thing but then all the rest of what can happen is really what yeah. excites me about the work all the connections inside you okay mia i understand that you have a giveaway for us where um people can sign up right below the right below this replay here this video and they can watch you, I guess you're on a Zoom session perhaps, helping someone with a frozen shoulder. Could you say something a little bit more about that? Uh, no, I think it speaks for itself. Uh, 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 how uh, sh she had a problem of not being able to lift her arm, raise her arm. And uh, I think the, the thing speaks for itself. Can, Okay, and I've heard it's a I've heard it's a pretty miraculous little ending there. So I know you don't want like a you don't want to ha have us just focus on the uh, 
the early gains, I guess, but it's nice to be able to see improvement. Yeah. And the, and the mechanism by which you do that with her. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if, if you show her and I know what to say. Okay, well, we'll the, you'll, you'll be able to You'll be able to see the actual video by, again, sign up below, and then you'll get to watch Mia working with her. And uh, Mia, what a super big pleasure for me. I so thank you for coming to be with us here in the Feldenkrais Awareness Summit. Nice. Thank you for coming. It was a pleasure for me too. Good, good. And uh, keep tuning in. Find look else at all the other great things you have for you today and join the panel discussion tonight and we'll um, we'll just keep we'll keep exploring together. We'll keep moving better and feeling better together. Thank Woo. you. <laughs> that we're gonna we're gonna get that yes, I can going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> bye bye.